part of the reason we took on the project in the first place was that we were, I mean, really where it started, yes, there was a love of the literature, but really where it started was um, we wanted to uh, take on something where we as a group could come together and, and produce something that was challenging. We wanted to produce something that, that um, people would, we could, we could really put our skills to the test. And what's nice is science fiction and fantasy, either one of those genres really do that because you have to build a world. Um, what I like about working in fantasy a little more than science fiction is that the, the world tends to be very tactile. It's like weathered wood and that kind of thing. Um, where, you know, science fiction tends to be a little more sleeker and you can do that with like CG, I think, easier than fantasy and have it sell. Um, so uh, a big part of the reason that we, we made that choice, I mean, you know, I think, Jason, even in, in your decisions about how to light and how to do those things, we were trying to set ourselves apart from other fantasy projects that had been done. At least that's, you know, I think what we were all trying to do is say, like, when people look at it, they don't go, oh, it's, it's Lord of the Rings ripoff. That's what we were trying to avoid. We're saying we want to say, this is our own distinct, distinct choice. I want to say one thing about the, Jen, about the cowl, uh, the cowl and the hat, that silhouette. Um, one of the reasons we went for the cowl is that we had just come out of uh, saturation with Lord of the Rings and with um, uh, Star Wars. A lot of cloaks, a lot of cloaks and hoods. And I said, I want to do something with the main character where he's wearing something that kind of says that shape of a, of a cloak, but when he pulls it down, it's not. It pulls us into a, it's, it pulls us into a different part, kind of that hybrid that I think even Jordan talked about between sort of medieval and slightly later periods, kind of mixing it up a little bit. Um, and I wanted to make sure we kind of did that, and also, again, to make it sort of distinct and make it a little different. Um, really quick. I want to talk, have uh, David Webb say something about the fact that he's a fan of the books. He worked on the second project that isn't done. But it'd be interesting to see someone who was a fan, right, who then had to play a part in someone else's adaptation. <laughs> well, I can tell you as being a, as being a fan of, <clears throat> of the work and, a fan, and an actor, who understands the film process, the writing process, all that stuff. I know, I know uh, a lot of these guys, and I'd seen Flight from Shadow, and I, and I bugged Rafe, and I'm like, you do another one, I'm in this. I mean, how can you have medieval, you don't have this? You know, I'm, 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 I'm that actor. And uh, so, finally, there was uh, an audition, and I actually auditioned for, when you see the film, I actually auditioned for the mayor. And somebody else fit it a little better, and they decided, you know what? There's there's a whole monologue, and I don't want to give too much away at the first. And they're like, we're gonna have we're gonna have Dave do that. As a fan, uh, you know things are written normally in film. There's the writer's version, there's the screenplay guy's version, then there's the director's view and the production. This whole thing comes full circle because the fans have seen the original work and now they've got to see the finished product. And it's kind of like if you tell somebody, you know, something next to you, you know, say a sentence to somebody next to you and pass it around the room, as soon as it gets to the end, it's not always the same. And then the guy that's the, that said it the first, he's like, oh man, I'm, I'm mad that the message didn't get to the end because they don't understand the process. There are so many challenges that they have talked about up here, um, costuming, and every single one of you here that have had, that have read the books, you created the world in your mind, on your own. And when it doesn't look like that, then you're like, well, what happened? So the challenge, um, you know, for me to watch it, again, as a fan, who's on the first end of it, and the guy that has to portray it, uh, you know, a convincing character on the end. It was fascinating for me to watch, you know, how it all went down and, and knowing the creative genius of, of the people involved. Um, it, you know, it was fascinating and it gave me a unique 
opportunity to really, really eat into the character and try to make the character my own, even as brief as it was. But when you see it, um, know that there are many, many challenges. And as an actor, it was, it was, it was priceless. Fantastic. Um, do we have any questions? Anybody have anything they want to ask? Yes. Could you, could you come up from that? Thank you. Uh, in the Wheel of Time novels, uh, Robert Jordan, a key uh, tool that he used uh, for character development, for story development, was inner monologue with characters. What kind of challenges and what, what tools did you utilize in film to convey that inner monologue and, and give it something that the audience could relate to and, and didn't kind of stand out in sort of a Blade Runner way? <laughs> well, yeah. And as a screenwriter, I don't, I don't care for voiceovers. I mean, there's stuff, Dexter, it works. Um, I just saw Warm Bodies. I thought the, the, the voiceover stuff worked really well there. So, but for the most part, if you're, if you as a screenwriter, as a filmmaker, is, is using the voiceover, all you're doing is you're trying to, to get out information that's supposed to be in the character's head or the disembodied voice that's kind of setting up, giving you background information. It's kind of a lazy, from a screenwriter standpoint, it's kind of a lazy way of storytelling cinematically. Film, you have action, and you have dialogue. You have body language, facial expressions, and you have the way the camera is used, angles and, and other types of shots to express what's going on. Uh, it's a, it's, from a storytelling standpoint, it's very limited. And that's, that's the challenge of writing a screenplay, is you have to get information out without going inside the character's head, because the audience can't go inside the character's head. And so what I did, and, and this made, really made me gain a, a lot of respect for screenwriters who have successfully adapted things like uh, Peter Jackson and, and Fran Walsh and Philip Boyens for the Lord of the Rings films, uh, Steve Cloves who wrote most of the Harry Potter films. Um, what I had to do was I had to take a lot of the stuff that was in here, I had to put it here and have them say a lot of those things and at the same time have it sound natural. It's a natural part of the scene, it's a natural part of the conversation and it can't come out like somebody's just saying things just for the audience's benefit. Because that then it, then, then it makes the character sound really stupid if you do that. So that was my challenge. I don't know if, if, um, if Jason uh, had any challenges as far as trying to get well, you know, information out from a visual said, standpoint. Yeah, I mean, there's tricks you can use to kind of illustrate that without having to hear it. That scene's cut down, but it still it, it kind still of implies that inner No, Matt, Matt would be one for sure. I think uh, with uh, um, this latest film that, that, that we shot, you know, we would definitely just slow push-ins on our, on our main subject as, as she, our... Uh, our Aes Sedai. Aes Sedai, thank you. We did um, Moraine in the second one. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot going on in her head, but we would just... We would just like Lord of the Rings, if you, if you look at Gandalf, he, he says a lot with his eyes. I mean, Peter Jackson nailed that in Lord of the Rings, where they would just be, uh, you know, like Frodo would hide something, and then it would just go to a real close-up of Ian McKellen's eyes, Gandalf's eyes, and he's there like, you know, he, he, he knew it, and we as the audience knew it, and that's the trick. That's how you do it cinematically, as opposed to just I think he has something in his pocket. <laughs> you know? um, and so, yeah, we, I mean, we did implement those tricks uh, on, on, on both films. I don't think we, we uh, I don't think the scripts, because these were short films, that we relied on them heavily, because like you said, the, the volume of work um, has it in it a lot, but we just took, you know, a, a fraction of that. Um, but but it, it's definitely there in place. But 
But there, you know, when you watch Flight from Shadow, there is a meeting between a Mirdral and an Aes Sedai, and they have a conversation that leads up to a confrontation between them. And the conversation, and this was the hardest part of writing the script for me, this scene, I probably rewrote this scene probably a dozen times, <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't think I got it right in the end, but I, I got it as close as I could. Um, and then we had to go shoot it, so I had to let it go. But um, the conversation between the two before they start going at each other uh, is basically a lot of that information is that, like I said before, the 390 pages of the book that I had to kind of say, uh, do kind of a, uh, so up to this point, this is what's going on, so that people could enter the story who hadn't read the book and not be confused. So. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes. yes. I'm curious about the legal challenges that you guys had to face doing this, and if you had any cease and desist letters and all that stuff, or I'm just curious how that No, works. actually, we have had, um, <laughs> surprisingly, um, I was waiting for that. I was waiting for you know something to happen. Um, they haven't said a word. In fact, um, you know, not, we've reached the we've reached a number of um, yeah. Wait till they get the second. No, I'm kidding. Um, actually, uh, one of the nice things about the second one is that uh, we're actually working in in consort a little bit with a group called Shire Post Mint. Who what they do is they make. They take, they get licensing to do coins. They've done Game of Thrones coins and others, and uh, they did the Crowns of Elisande, and that's kind of, it's kind of where the second project came from. But uh, we had to, because we we're working with them, and they were working with Bandersnatch, which is uh, the sort of like the in-house Jordan Estate production. So we were actually working in, in concert with Maria Simmons, who was uh, Jordan's executive secretary. She probably knows more about. We, she knows more about Wheel of Time than Robert Jordan did. Um, but uh, how many drafts? We did like six, I think. Then we have to. Yeah, she she kept she kept sending back notes saying this is not right. This would never happen. Right. Uh, so Maureen would never do this in this type of setting, and it was nice having that feedback because. And I and I kind of got from the tone of her notes that she was she was waiting for some pushback from us, and uh, because you know we, we did take some liberties with Flight from Shadow, uh, we weren't doing it in concert with anyone from Jordan's estate or, or Universal, so we, we 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 did some things that that maybe they would have said no to, had had the situation been different, and I think they were waiting for some pushback, but I was like, oh cool, and I would just. Uh, make a change and send it back. And I, I noticed that she got a lot friendlier. <laughs> she, she did. She as, did get a lot friendlier. As, 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 as uh, I would make changes and, and you know, uh, do what she, take the story where she wanted it to go so it was more authentic to her as a, an, an actual representative of, of Robert Jordan's estate. So we, we um, have had, and uh, this is, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to state before I say the next two things I'm about to say, nothing is written in stone, but we are, um, uh, we have, we have had a conversation, I'll say it's a conversation, um, about if we had the opportunity, what we would do, and I think we've actually come up with a plan to effectively break down the entire series into an episodic and how we could do that. I think we came up with, what was it, about 138 episodes it would be, something like that. Um, it was a guess. Um, seven, and 20, no, it was 20 episodes over seven seasons. Well, yeah, but I'm saying total for the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. It, was something, it was right around there. Yeah. So we've had that conversation, and we have, so if it should happen that uh, they decide that, you know, we might be those people, which would be cool, you know, um, we kind of decided we better have a plan, and we have one. So we have no delusions of grandeur. Though. No, <laughs> actually, we have all delusions. There are delusions of grandeur. Um, the side of the table. <laughs> so um, and uh, and then with this this second one, um, we really because we first of all we brought two new characters. I'll tell you this: we have both Perrin and Moraine in the second one. 
Um, and we knew that because of the feedback we've gotten on the first one, that we really made an effort to try to nail those characters as close. And what was interesting... So and Lorraine I, does not have a hat. Yes, she does not, <laughs> she does not have a hat. Um, she does. She does. We tried to get her to wipe it off, but anyway. Um, no, let, let me tell you, uh, and, and do we have stills on line of, of Cabrino? Um, I, on, I think in buried in my Facebook page I have some, some stills that I put up. Anyway, a local actress named Cabrina Miller, uh, she, uh, Jennifer created a, a beautiful blue, very Aes Sedai looking outfit for her. She had the jewel on the middle of her forehead. And the jewel is also made by Badali Jewelers, who is actually licensed to, to create um, replica jewelry based on these kinds of fantasy series, Lord of the Rings, Wheel of Time, etc. Please take a moment, stop by and visit their booth in the finish. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, Cabrina of uh, Raven posted a picture of Cabrina shortly after we did production uh, she was on set. She's posing. It was in between takes. She's posing on set. And I'll let you take the rest of the story. Okay. Did you know the details? So what happened is I, I was... Well, actually, those were stills. Yeah. Okay. Those, were, those were stills. Those were raw stills from the shoot. And I put up the still of her kind of standing lit and the thing. And, and um, because of Flight from Shadow, uh, I've reached out and gotten to know, like, Wheel of Time fans all over the world. I'm, I'm in groups, you know, on Facebook from Italy... That was a cool side deviation. That was a cool thing. We were approached by a group called the Save Moraine Group in Italy, who specifically asked us if they could write Italian subtitles for Flight from Shadow that they then submitted to the channel and uploaded. So there is a version with Italian subtitles. Um, we've also been approached because a lot of people in Brazil like it. I don't know what that's about, but now uh, they want Portuguese subtitles too. But anyway. Um, but I, I put it up, and and uh, there is a you know how they have the character face or the, the character pages on Facebook. Uh, the Moraine page contacted me and said, "Yep, that's me." <laughs> I went, "Yes, <laughs> we've done the thing." They'll hate us later, I'm sure, but you know. Um, so no, it was it was very it was very cool, and I responded back to them, and they were like, "Yeah, that's, it was it was like the way that many people are picturing her." So that's. And I have just a side note about that uh, when we were casting the new one. Um, we set this casting, you know, kind of, it was sort of quick. We, we, yeah. we didn't have a lot of time. And if you were here. Because hearing, Bandersnatch came back and said, yep, let's go to production. And we were like, ah, uh, okay. We, uh, <laughs> okay, we let's go. We have actors. We have a cinematographer. <laughs> <laughs> we got costume. <laughs> we have intent. Um, so, so. Uh, we, we do this, uh, we start this casting session, and if you remember back in December, anybody that was here, that was when that first really big snowstorm hit. <laughs> so it was like 6.30 at night, and there was suddenly, I don't know, it was like four inches of snow, and it was just coming down. And uh, so we we're like, like, wow, great, our additions, no one's gonna show up for this and fight through, you know, traffic and everything. So they, so they, uh, so we, we showed up, and this was just a little bit about adaptation. Um, he had written the script, uh, you know, around specific characters, specific ways, and uh, when the people showed up, we were so pleased with their dedication of driving through the snowstorm that we went, you know what, we're gonna find a way to work almost every one of these people into our film that showed up, and sure enough, uh, uh, we did. Blake did some, some little restructuring, and we found a way to make it so that everybody that came out, they weren't just extras, you know, everybody got a talk, I think. Everybody got a talk, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. But then Cabrina came, and she read, and I remember you looked at me, and I looked at you, and it was like, <laughs> it was like goosebumps, man. And it was funny, too, because she was sort of like, da, 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 da. it's like, okay, you ready? And boom, she was Moraine. <laughs> it, was like, <laughs> it was good times. Um, and then, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh. There.